Thank you very much. Uh, I thank to the Copernicus Center for inviting me to do this lecture and also later in the week participate in a symposium on explanation and uh, hosting me, a wonderful people, a wonderful town. Um, my own, uh, the, the lecture reflects, of course, where I am. I'm teaching at Leiden University in I have a position in philosophy of religion in a state university. So it's a, a public university. It's supposed to be looking more from an outsider perspective on religion than from a participant point of view. But the philosophy of religion is always a bit on, uh, well, more moving to the inside perspective than most of my colleagues who are more historians and, uh, well, hi historians of religion, scholars of religious studies. Uh, that's the nature of the department I function in within the larger humanities world. My original training was in physics, so I started in natural sciences and later moved into theology and philosophy. Um, for this lecture, well, well, maybe one remark about the title or the subtitle, uh, Religious Options that Respect Science. Um, I've been in discussion with some who think, well, that's somewhat asymmetrical. Why not also talk about science respecting religion? Uh, I do think there's in, indeed an asymmetry. I do think that uh, science, in a sense, functions far more uh, cross-culturally without a strong personal uh, involvement, and that religion is more uh, learning from science than the other way around. But anyhow, that might come up in the discussion period afterwards as well. Um, oh. oh, is this readable? Yeah. Not, not here. Yeah. Uh, the discussions on religion and science in general, I think they are uh, very diverse. There are many books. Uh, much of it has been uh, playing out in the English language uh, speaking world, uh, United States and uh, Britain. Uh, but, well, there is also a lively European uh, net of discussions. I just met, speaking of Liana here, we were together, and Michael Heller, for instance, earlier in a European society on religion, uh, for, or as that is, the European Society for the Study of Science and Theology. Uh, but that brings together people of many different backgrounds and being involved in those discussions on theology and science and religion and science, I'm always amazed not just that people disagree on the answers, but that they pose so different questions, that what one person considers very important for someone else might not even be recognized as, as being something to think about. So that uh, the discussion is also what are the issues and what are the main questions to pay attention to, uh, how to formulate the right questions, and when you talk about religion and science, uh, there are three things. There is thinking about science, there is thinking about religion, but it's the most difficult part maybe is think about uh, this word and, how do they relate? Uh, and I think that's part of what I try to get a better understanding of, but uh, well, it's never finished. Uh, as a kind of main message of, of my own presentation today uh, is in relation to what I just said about the title, uh, that in order to be both meaningful, to be meaningful, uh, they do not have to be similar. Uh, in mind that some uh, projects in religion and science are very much treating the two as similar and trying to argue that science is, uh, that religion is has a similar cognitive standing as science, that you can talk about, well, on the uh, more or less anti-science wing, as we perceive it, scientific creationism. They try to present themselves as if it's kind of science, but also in other branches, whereas I think there is more uh, difference, but because they're different, they can coexist. If they're the same, they would be more competing uh, than need be. Uh, being categorically different, different in kind, is important. Okay, the lecture has two parts uh, following the title. The first part is the subtitle, Religious Options that Respect Science. Thinking about the general issue, what would it mean to respect science, why you respect science, uh, and what does it not imply. And the second part is about three core issues that I think are from a philosophical type of point of view, 
the kind of abstract notions that allow for important areas of discussion, uh, mystery, values, and meaning. And they're all, in a sense, challenged. Uh, for instance, the notion of mystery, if we understand so much about the world, is there still a meaningful notion of mystery left, or is mystery more or less uh, disappearing? Uh, and what about values in a context of a world which we understand what I call values in a world of facts? And uh, if it's all material, what about meaning? Where, where do we place that? How do we understand that kind of language? Uh, so the first half is about uh, respecting science and why respect science is the first part. Um, let me make sure I don't see. I think there are a couple of intrinsic reasons, reasons that reflect the strength of science, the nature of science, as it has developed in the last two centuries or so, some of it longer. Well, here in the town you refer back to Copernicus, maybe that's a kind of more, uh, nice starting point, but, but it has taken off, at least uh, importantly, in the last two centuries. Uh, and one of the important, there's strengths that are theoretical in nature, that we see, say, in physical sciences, chemistry, but now reaching well into the biological sciences, that there's enormous power of uh, theoretical unification. That starts maybe in the early period of unifying what goes up in the heavens uh, and what goes up, uh, what happens on Earth uh, about matter, about gravity, so on. That's time of Galileo, of Newton and others. Uh, you get later, much later, unification of the understanding of, uh, well, electricity and magnetism become unified and you see larger integrations up to more recent physics where uh, it's all understood in terms of four forces uh, that are part of a single, well, not totally, but the drive is there towards unification, towards a more integrated perspective. I think the best symbol of this drive towards unification in understanding science is maybe the periodic table of elements. Understanding that hydrogen, helium, and then you get all the other chemical elements, uh, 90 or so, or, well, depending a bit on the high, heavier end, um, that is a table that is well rooted in physics, in terms of atomic physics, of underlying physics. It also shows the kind of chemical elements that reach well into organic biology, uh, understanding what goes on. It, the kind of chemistry is the kind of intermediary discipline where you see how much, if you don't go to the extremes of, of uh, cosmology or so on, but in, in ordinary working science, how much uh, has been achieved, how much of it is um, reaching uh, cross-cultural, I mean the chemical table, uh, well the name of Mendeleev is connected to it, a Russian, uh, but it's used everywhere, it's, it's independent of, of culture, it's, it's a good example of unification I think of knowledge that has come up in different places, some of it, French helium, the second element, was discovered first in an astronomical context and only later on Earth, uh, it comes from different contexts, but it fits together, and it doesn't seem that we have any material object that doesn't somehow can be understood in those terms. Uh, if you, we look at what is it made of, we always end up with the same kind of elements. It's, there are no exceptions in that area. Of course, light is not made of, of chemical elements, but, but uh, in, in what it tries to do, it, it catches uh, in a fairly complete sense uh, in doing so, in, in understanding in modern science, I think we've seen an enormous expansion of knowledge. Uh, well, cosmology, studying the universe is an enormous expansion uh, towards the small, understanding more and more small things. Uh, uh, and the coming with it, I think with increasing knowledge in science, and part of the strength of science is also that we have uh, discovered that we have certain ideas wrong. It starts with the flat earth, uh, has been abandoned, of course, easily. A geocentric view has been abandoned. Uh, over time, more and more things, uh, while we learned new things, we have also changed our understanding of reality, maybe the understanding of substance as, uh, as excluding empty space. Uh, there's a lot of empty space, even in, in massive objects. Uh, all kinds of understandings that were there have to be modified, but in doing so, we have learned so then there's this, this strength of science as understanding, as 
as a collection of theories, which I think is so impressive that even if it's doubts the human achievement, it's, it's there and it's something that uh, should be respected for what it achieves. Uh, and it's not just there as a theoretical construction, but it's also there uh, as something that is extremely applicable, that is, can be used. Now, uh, colleagues in, in physics might develop uh, macro, uh, microscopes, well, that's the wrong word, but tools that can manipulate at the level of single atoms, uh, do things. Um, so for some time, say uh, longer ago, electrons were kind of speculative entities. Uh, and then you get that people say, well, I can use electrons as tools in electron microscopy. So use them as tools to discover new things. Well, and it turns out to work so well. So there is, it's not only a huge kind of mathematical structure, but it's something that seems to work in the real world. So why respect science? I think because science is such a, a strong achievement of humans. It's not made up and it could go away easily. It seems to have caught something about reality. There's a second kind of considerations that are important to me, which are more specific to religion and science. Why do we do religion and science? I think part of it is kind of apologetics. Part of it is apologetics for religion to a science-minded audience, those who accept science and wonder whether religion is meaningful. Well, if you want to talk to them, you better share their kind of point of view and talk with them, assuming, respecting science. If you say, well, I come, uh, you think science and religion are in conflict or, and that religion has lost in a sense, uh, well, if you don't start uh, in that communication with saying, well, we appreciate what science has, has shown, uh, you have lost them already right at the beginning. I think the other side of it is uh, that religion and science is also apologetics for science. It's apologetics for, um, among religiously minded people, to have them accept science. Uh, I think that's partly the case in the United States, where there's far more ambivalence about accepting science, especially evolutionary biology, but also other related disciplines. And part of what's going on in religion and science is saying, well, uh, religious people don't be afraid of science because, uh, well, and let us teach science, learn about science. It need not undermine uh, what's important to you. Well, in that project, I think that, and uh, I think many of my American colleagues are involved in a sense, or there's a website, Science and Religion Today. If you see most of those items in that website are uh, kind of science communication. They're informing people about science, about what's going on, and then hopefully they will be uh, intrigued, but also become accepting of the science. Well, if that's the kind of project, uh, again, it's better to use good science to, and to respect science than to uh, sell them something uh, that's not really science. So the, the part of the discussion of why respect science, well, maybe the first two are also a difference between kind of the secular part of Europe, uh, certainly the Netherlands and uh, other parts uh, to some extent, uh, and the other is more the, Europe, the American example, where uh, religion is more self-evident, but then taken for granted, but then science is more in dispute. Um, there's another side to it, is that there is a lot of internal dispute about in religious communities. For instance, I already referred to uh, scientific creationism. Well, that's a dispute mo not just between science and Christianity, but it's a dispute mostly within Protestant Christianity at first in the United States between different branches of, of Protestant Christianity. And you'll find that the, the strongest enemies from the perspective of those who advocate creationism are those who uh, say, well, you can reconcile it, who are evolutionary theists who say, well, I, I do accept evolution and I'm still a Christian. 
Uh, so part of the discussion is internal to, in this case, Protestantism about who speaks for, for Christianity. And similarly, uh, in other contexts, I had a graduate student who was studying how the Dalai Lama, the Tibetan Buddhist leader, deals with science. Uh, well, that seems partly an external apologetic project, uh, telling the outside world, well, Tibetan Buddhism is consistent with science, and so we are uh, a good option for you. But it's also, if you look more closely, a fight within the Buddhist world and the Tibetan Buddhist world between, say, uh, reformist and the Dalai Lama in this respect being one, uh, and the abbots of major monasteries who would like to keep that out. So when the Tibetan, the Dalai Lama sets up a program science for monks, uh, he is in a sense reaching to the monks and trying to get them informed about science, but in that sense he's also involved in an internal structure about the future of Buddhism. And so too, in the world of Islam, uh, I think the big issue, just uh, aside of science, but the big issue is who speaks for the Muslims? Uh, that's the deep struggle. Uh, and of course, the radicals think the, the liberals are way too liberal. Uh, and that happens again and again. And in that internal debate, I think science is often used by all parties as an assistant, as a kind of uh, authority to appeal to, saying, well, we have science on our side back to the example of creationism, it's not that they just say, well, uh, we believe the Bible and therefore we are creationists. They try to present themselves as scientific creationists. They try to say, well, we have a better understanding, uh, not that they have been successful in convincing the scientists, but they do try to point to fossils and, uh, and make their case in scientific terms. Even in the internal debates, it's often helpful to claim to have the authority of science on your side. Uh, so those are kind of pragmatic considerations. If you are in the middle of discussions, that I think it's good to, to uh, pay attention to science, to use science. Uh, I think there's a, a theological argument as well. If you operate in a kind of theistic perspective and see the world as God's creation, then I think there's a long tradition of saying, well, that means that all knowledge of creation is to be appreciated. There's a whole medieval tradition of writing books on the six days of creation. Oh, so, the, not the seventh day, but the, uh, but those are books that communicate, in a sense, the, the scientific knowledge of their time. Of course, not modern science. And you see it later, uh, often a metaphor of two books, of saying, well, we can learn about God from scripture, but also from um, the book of nature. There's that language that respects that the world, if the world is assumed to be, this is not about arguing, but about a kind of assumption. If you assume that this is God's creation, then everything we learn about the world is to be appreciated, and we better try not to uh, do less than we can, try to have the best available knowledge. So I do think that there is a, a good a theological reason as well, uh, aside of the strength of science, uh, how to do it, how to appreciate science. I think uh, a very important part is to respect science as it's done by the scientists. So not to, to engage in a kind of self-invented science. I, I'm also the editor of a journal, Saigon, uh, of religion and science. I do receive many papers, of course, many good papers, luckily, but also some that Somehow people think, well, we have solved the, the riddle of the world, we know how to do it, and they have a grand theory and everything fits together, and somehow they send it to this journal, whereas they, if they claim it's the unification of all theories of physics, they should first try the physicists. One of my first experiences in teaching on religion and science was a course in Chicago, actually, and one of the students had written a paper um, and to her understanding, the resurrection was important, the Christology. And in the paper, she made the case that the famous formula E is mc squared, which comes from Einstein, about a certain equivalence of energy and mass, that before the resurrection, that had been E is mc. And I was puzzled, but she said, well, yes, with the res resurrection, Jesus comes Jesus Christ. You see an extra C there. 
And so it fitted for her, it fitted together. But if you would try it with, with physicists, uh, ESMC and ESMC squared, they would say, well, that doesn't work in dimensions. It doesn't work at all. I mean, it was, it was a nice kind of narrative kind of uh, for her presenting something, uh, but it was not engaging with real science. It was inventing something that fitted her uh, program and allowed her an opportunity to articulate that. I think that's uh, an example of what should be avoided. And in a sense, if you have a larger project, like I once did a book on cosmology and religion, uh, it's good to have a kind of supervisors, not only from philosophy or theology, but also a scientist participating, uh, looking whether the science at least is done some justice, uh, rather than having a, a philosophy project uh, that somehow is not recognized by the scientists, not for the philosophy, I mean, they can leave that, but at least say, well, as far as the science is involved, you have done justice to what's going on. So uh, is that enough to, to use mainstream science? I, I think there is an issue there that uh, the philosophical issues often move beyond mainstream science. We are interested in very fundamental questions about uh, the origin of the universe or uh, the, the nature of matter or whether quantum reality is deterministic or not deterministic, the kind of philosophical issue. And some of those are not uh, solved or finally resolved by current science. They, they go beyond current science. So in those kind of projects, uh, in a sense, it's unavoidable that you do more than just uh, textbook science, more than the consolidated parts of science. But at least then it should be acknowledged that this is engaging in what is currently in science a speculative area, uh, which might work out and which might not work out, but at least show the hypothetical nature rather than uh, pose, well, science has shown that, and then make it uh, run well ahead of what's going on. Uh, well, the third point, scientific questions to be judged by the scientific community. In a sense, I already said that, that that's, I think, where uh, if you want to make the case that ESMC has been the proper formula before it became ESMC squared, well, you first try to convince the physicists and only then start using it philosophically or theologically. In this case, it won't work. I'm quite sure of that, but uh, some other things might be a creative idea coming from an outsider. Well, then that, that's welcome, but that's, uh, the audience is not always this kind of mixed audience. If you want, like the Copernicus Center is very interdisciplinary, if you want to do interdisciplinary work, you have to be respectful to the disciplines uh, and accept, in a sense, their authority in their own areas of competence. Um, Part of the concern about respecting science is that uh, uh, there is a, a certain cultural skepticism about science or skepticism about knowledge, relativism about saying, well, yes, that's maybe true from your perspective, but it's just a perspective. Uh, and I do think that there's something correct about some of those forms of relativism. I, there are clearly multiple human perspectives on things, but precisely in the natural sciences, we seem to have reached well beyond that and have achieved results that are uh, strong. And to play down those results, I think, is, is not just intellectually falling short of what could be done, but it also, is also a moral issue. I think the moral issue about using best available knowledge, well, for me, a uh, kind of hero in that respect, has been in the 19th century, an author, William Clifford, who had an article titled, The Ethics of Belief. I said, well, if you want to believe something, that's not directly about religious belief, but about believing some claim. Well, that's a moral issue. He used the example of someone sending a ship to sea and not checking whether it's seaworthy. And the ship goes under and people die in it. I said, well, it's not just that this person made an economic mistake, but he made a failure in believing that the ship was seaworthy without properly checking it. Uh, if your beliefs have consequences, uh, then you better take, uh, well, a high 
ambition there to be as good as you can. Of course, you cannot avoid relying on others as well. No human can, can check everything, but then you try to rely on others. One example of which I came across in religion and science where I was, uh, well, disappointed were some colleagues uh, who were, in a sense, playing down science in trying to make room for things they considered important. And then they came to the case of uh, AIDS and HIV. There is a virus, HIV, that is considered to be the virus that causes AIDS under the right conditions. Well, in the early days, 87 or so, uh, first the virus was known and then the virus was a speculative idea but not yet accepted. And at some point it became accepted. One of the persons who in the early period was doubting that this virus was it was Peter Duisberg, a famous vir virologist, I think Nobel Prize winner, anyhow of major standing in, in his field. And he has continued that position since the 98, late 1980s. So there is a, a group that denies that HIV is the cause of AIDS. It's a very small group, a very marginal in the scientific community. You don't find it basically anymore in the, in the scientific literature. You find it in some popular literature. But it's used uh, to play down this knowledge. It's used to play down this knowledge with severe consequences. It was the point of reference for a South African president, the previous one, uh, Mbeki, to deny this link and therefore to push against uh, vi antiviral medicine because that was all pushed by the pharmaceutical industry and, well, this was not really the cause of, of AIDS. Uh, well, in, in going for a very marginal position or something that in scientific terms was outdated and building his policy on that, I think he, he had a huge impact which was disastrous for many people. So I think there's a moral issue about using good science and not avoiding it. Um, uh, well, in emphasizing to respect science, I think it's also an issue what's not implied in respecting science. I do think there are at least two issues that are important from a philosophical point of view. I think one is about moral issues. Uh, I do think that with modern knowledge, we do learn things that are important, like learning the link between HIV and AIDS, which I just mentioned. Uh, but I don't think that the moral questions themselves are answered only by having the scientific part of it. If you have a moral co conclusion, a moral judgment, there's somewhere earlier in the process a moral premise, uh, which is a, a very standard kind of philosophical issue uh, that goes under the name of the is-ought distinction, the difference between factual type of statements and normative claims about recommendations about how you should behave or about the naturalistic fallacy. But still, it does arise in our type of discussions that sometimes uh, the scientific description, say the evolutionary history of humans, so we are by by our evolutionary history, maybe males are more violent than females or whatever. I mean, you find all kinds of arguments, but even if they are uh, descriptively uh, right, there's still this question, well, is this how we want to continue? There's a, a moral issue about uh, the judgment, which is different. Uh, and the word natural often has a kind of double load, uh, also as a descriptive notion, something comes from nature, but also as a recommendation. And that's, I think, a, a risky transition. I'll come back to it later because that's what we do, I think, in a sense, in a religious interpretation. Uh, but there's a certain risk involved in making that transition. So I think the science doesn't deliver by itself any moral conclusions. And the other is the questions about ultimate explanations. Um, I use the periodic table of the elements as a kind of symbol of, of scientific knowledge. And if you explore what hydrogen, for instance, you get to uh, protons and electrons. And if you ask, well, electrons, they are electrons, but protons might consist of quarks. And if you dig deeper, uh, it might be described in terms of superstrings, but that becomes speculative science. It's not that we know what matter is, in a sense. It's not that we have 
the ultimate understanding of it. It's more that we have at our human level and some level smaller and, and bigger, a good workable understanding, but it's not the answer to what is matter. And also when it comes to origin questions, we can understand, for instance, in, in cosmological terms, where the earth, how the earth has formed by going back to an earlier stage. Of course, that's kind of reconstruction from the present looking towards the past, but that's a very successful type of project in Big Bang cosmology, reaching further and further back. But if you try to think about, well, the ultimate question, where does it all come from, that somehow uh, seems to slip through. Any scientific explanation of the current situation uses, say if you want to explain the weather now or, and predict it for tomorrow, you say, well, the weather was such, and so we have this kind of information, and we know the laws of nature, and from there we predict what it will be. Uh, but you can't do without those laws, and you can't do without an earlier stage. And somehow, I think all scientific explanations have this, this structure that they cannot avoid doing without assumptions that are about an earlier stage and about the process, about the kind of laws of nature that bring one from one stage to the other. So I th don't think that in reaching further and further back, uh, in the end, everything will be explained. There was at once an article uh, by uh, Stephen Hawking, a British cosmologist, man in a wheelchair, very, well, icon in a sense of a scientific uh, mind. Uh, and he had an, uh, the claim there that this, what he was calculating, is the probability from, for the universe to arise from nothing, to come out of nothing. But if you look more carefully, he made a kind of probability argument that there was a certain probability, which means that you need a certain space of possibilities where you can put a measure on, where it wasn't really from nothing in the sense of totally nothing, and it used certain ways of calculating that were already assumed. You don't get it totally, I mean, it was a remarkable thing, but it's, it's like physicists sometimes talk about a vacuum as the kind of source of, of things, but even empty space still has the properties of, of space. Uh, it's not about nothing. Uh, so the kind of ultimate why questions, I think, do remain beyond the science. Well, talking about science and religion, the other side of it is, of course, reflecting on religion. Uh, and everyone knows, of course, religion. Uh, but then that tends to be one's own religion. Uh, that's kind of standard. So it's, it's uh, interesting to, to look somewhat broader. And I think the anthropologists have made their profession of doing that, those kind of things. Clifford Geertz is a famous anthropologist, studied on, well, Dutch East India, uh, or Indonesia, and uh, Northern Africa, and various places. Uh, and he ha gives a definition of religion that I find useful with some correction. So this is about a religion. This is not religion as such, but a particular religion is a system of symbols which acts to establish powerful, pervasive, long-lasting moods and motivations in man, well, it should have been, of course, humans, but by formulating conceptions of a general order of existence and clothing these conceptions with, with such an aura of fictivity that the moods and motivations seem uniquely realistic. Well, that's a couple of elements. Anyhow, he starts with a system of symbols, I think also rituals, practices belong to it as well, but anyhow, what do those symbols do? Well, first they establish moods and motivations. So they give a certain guidance to how people think they uh, experience the world, appreciate it, or find it horrible, certain moods, and also motivations of how they want to act in relation to it. Uh, so that's one side. There is this dimension of values, of aesthetic and moral values uh, that are nourished by those symbols. If that's if that's missing, you might have a philosophical system, but not a religion, at least in his understanding of it. Uh, so it's to establish those modes and motivations, those value dimensions in humans, by formulating a conception of a general order of existence. So by offering a proposal of how you can see the world, how things are. Uh, and 
well, the final part, closing these conceptions, which such an aura of fictivity is such a, an understanding as real that they seem realistic. Maybe an example, if in a theistic context like Christianity, it said, well, God created the world. That is partly uh, something of this general order of existence. It does say something about how, where it comes from. But if you say that as a religious statement, it's not just saying something metaphysically, well, God created the world, and not uh, it came by itself or whatever, but it's also a kind of moral appeal that it, in a religious context, brings with it the assumption that one should treat it as receive it with gratitude and treat it with responsibility. So in the religious expression, I think, of, of for instance, doctrine of creation, it's doctrine of creation is not just, uh, well, like science, in a sense, doing the descriptive job, understanding it, but it's also offering a prescriptive. Uh, the same Clifford Geert speaks also of models of the world and models for the world. Models of the world, which is more the descriptive side, and for the world, which are more the orientation of how to, how to move on. I think that's typical of uh, a, a living religion, that there are those two sides to it. So I try as this kind of, of uh, schedule to work with uh, to say, well, what's a, a theology doing? Uh, a, th a theological vision? It's a bit in, in, in trying to do the same uh, in, in other words that gives us in his definition. A theological vision or maybe a humanistic vision, may, maybe different types. It integrates two things. On the one hand, there's this cosmological side of it. It does say something about the order of existence. And that's fed by theories, by scientific theories. And beyond that, by scientific observations and experiments. And of course, that begins in human daily life when we have experiences that, in a sense, are the beginning of science, of things falling and breaking and, uh, well, ordinary knowledge, in a sense, and science is refining that and and developing that. And the other side of this uh, vision is that it also has a certain value system to it, that there are certain, axiology is a, an expensive word for, for a value system, for a view of values. Uh, what are the most important things? And they can be different in different uh, systems. They can be different for different schools. So the ethical side of it, and that, well, like observations in science, goes back maybe to moral intuitions, to uh, something that is less uh, theoretically made uh, articulate and more immediately available. And that too, of course, goes to back to human lives in the, in the life as lived, in the practice of it, where we have, in practice, we do mix value judgments and, and expectations about how the world behaves. We mix them all the time. Uh, and in the theoretical reflection, we have separated them. Science, in a sense, abstracts from the moral things, whether you like it or not, this is how it works, and reflects on that. Uh, and, well, the ethical discourse, in a sense, tries to, well, be fair to the world, but also has its own uh, abstraction in thinking about values and how they work. Uh, but in the, in the religious vision, the two, I think, should come together again. And there's room there. So I, I think a theology in that sense, philosophically speaking, is a constructive project, this kind of highest level of synthesis, uh, where is and ought, those two sides of it are brought together. Philosophically problematical, I mentioned that, but I think that's typical, and it's, it's what makes a religion important. If it's not having those two sides, it becomes more just a speculative exercise. Uh, so the, there's underdetermination. I do think that in this vertical build up, in a sense of observations to theories, and also from theories to the overarching view, there is room for various ways of doing the integration. It's not a, a one-way uh, street, uh, and there's integration at this highest level, which somehow has to feed back or relate to 
uh, integration at the lowest level, at how it works together in human lives. Um, so that's how I would try to keep the two sides together, the, the scientific and the moral, and say, well, the typical of the religious language is the integration of the two. One counter voice, uh, a German philosopher around 1800, Schleiermacher, uh, who says, well, actually, religion is something else than both cosmology in the philosophical sense and also of morality. This quote, in order to take possession of its own domain, religion renounces herewith all claims to whatever belongs to those others, and that is cosmology and ethics, and gives back everything that has been forced upon it. Religious essence is neither thinking nor acting, but intuition and feeling. So he, he moves to a kind of third type of activity, whereas I'm closer to saying, well, maybe it's, it does connect to both thinking or science and the theoretical side and acting and orientation, but it's, um, it's the, in the nature of the integration that there is also this, this dimension of, of, well, feeling of aesthetic preference of, of how it belongs together. Okay, that's the first, well, maybe more than half, the kind of methodological considerations. Uh, the second half is where do I see the interesting do uh, discussions that are appropriate? Uh, and well, basically, those three words mystery, values, and meaning are the three chapters. The longest part about mystery in an intelligible universe. I think what we've learned in the last, well, centuries from science is that the universe is by and large intelligible, that we may be surprised about many things. But if we look more closely, if we study more closely, that scientists come up with explanations that seem to fit well with other explanations. It's, the world could have been different. The world could have been totally beyond any human intellig intelligibility. It could have been uh, too difficult or it could have been too haphazard all the time. But, well, that's not what comes. And the basic picture of nature, natural reality is that it is... Uh, multi-layered, that there are different levels of description and that at each level you can work quite well and take into account lower levels and higher levels uh, but to, uh, to some extent you can postpone that and, and work, say, like the periodic table, you can describe chemistry with elements without thinking about quarks, without thinking what do they consist of. You can do uh, chemistry well with just that level of description and at another level, you can forget about the chemistry and, uh, well, talk about uh, psychology uh, and, and do things. So at different levels of description, it works well, but there is this huge integrity. Uh, the levels don't contradict each other. They st somehow have to fit well. So I do think that there is uh, philosophically something to be said for what's called naturalism, of saying, well, basically, uh, we think we there's one type of reality, and that's what we call nature, and uh, that is intelligible in, in those types of terms that we have uh, formulated in the sciences. Uh, that's, uh, there's a philosophical discussion whether that's something that you assume a priori before you do any thing. I think it's more a posteriori, that with the discoveries of science, we more and more come to well, be naturalist in this sense of saying, well, that's what reality is like. The philosophical interpretation is open, but the, the ontological type is, well, sticking to my example, the periodic table does capture what we see as matter at some level. Of course, there are other types of matter as well, so we, we aren't there yet, but they, they will come to fit in the larger picture. And in terms of natural history, where does it come from? Uh, that seems to be enormous in coherence from uh, human history, biological history, cosmological history. It, it is, in a sense, one lo long story that could be told. What options are there in terms of, oh, maybe with the previous one, uh, one comment, what for theology is an issue there is often it's called the god of the gaps. Whether the scientific understanding is so complete that uh, well, in the past, we didn't know about uh, lightning, and Zeus was creating lightning. Well, 
nowadays we think lightning is part of the natural phenomena. It's remarkable, but it's, um, it's not a divine act in itself. And in a sense, more and more uh, is the emphasis on the integrity excluding divine acts that are of such a kind, that they are, in a sense, gaps in our current understanding, and that that is where, where theology should put its, uh, uh, its focus on. Part of the creationist or the intelligent design debate is about finding gaps and then arguing against those gaps. Uh, that's part of the, the tug of war in religion science. But I don't think that is a fruitful strategy. So what else, what other strategies are there? Well, I think there is a, a form of theism that is a genuine option, that is a genuine possibility in line with this understanding of science. Um, accepting the intelligibility in nature and wondering whether that points to a certain intelligibility of nature, of saying, well, this, this is so well structured, there might be a higher order of rationality behind it. I think that's a voice, well, I've, I think I've heard Michael Heller presenting it at various occasions, uh, someone like Erna McMullen, the other philosopher, uh, is, I think, a historically a good example. So it's not uh, arguing as if there is a proof for the existence of God. I don't think that that works. If you look more closely, those types of arguments that have been presented as proofs uh, put in so much assumptions that are uh, not delivering uh, the kind of conclusions. But in a theistic perspective, it fits. It fits to say, well, this uh, reality that the scientists study and that we have come to see with all its integrity might have its source in a creator or have its existence due to a ground of being, if it's a different type of philosophical discourse. Um, I don't think there's any inconsistency there. So where some would say, well, the kind of naturalism you present automatically excludes theism, I think it's more naturalism about nature. And that leaves open the question how you understand nature at a higher level. But that's a philosophical type of discussion it does raise the question of how you see, think about God's mode of action. If you exclude uh, the gaps option, uh, God's mode of action is clearly bringing it into existence, sustaining it at all times, making it possible. Um, well, some would say that that's so different from any type of action that we see within nature that you have to articulate that either it's primary and secondary causality as creating natural causes or as a timeless relation to reality that's different from all things that happen in time. Uh, well, there are huge philosophical discussions there, I think, that are maybe influenced by science but are not determined by it. Uh, the other way of speaking of it, God as ground, as sustaining, I find, but that's more imagery, a quote from an English novelist, John Fowles, helpful to say, well, to the white paper that contains a drawing. That's why I find that a nice image of, well, a reality as we see it, that's the drawing, but it's there because there is something that sustains it. The space that contains a building, the silence that contains a sonata, the passage of time that prevents a sensation or object continuing forever, all these are God. Well, I mean, he, he puts quotation marks there. He, he takes a certain freedom in in, uh, in using the language, but there's something I think that, well, something appeals to me in, in this um, acceptance of, uh, of a certain dualism in the understanding of reality, but, but bring it close to one another as well. So I think that's a genuine option. Another one, and I encounter that also among, well, some scientists who are philosophically minded and think about religion, or um, well, also some American friends who are more already religious, but somehow want not to be in this dualist version, is what they call religious naturalism. Say, so, well, their natural reality is loaded with value. That's, I think, how they see reality. There's a book, for instance, by a bio biologist, uh, Ursula Goodenough, that's called The Sacred Depths of Nature. And uh, in her biological work, her work with cells and whatever, uh, she, something appeals to her 
that is touching on this value issue. And it's not that she uh, doesn't recognize that professionally uh, the value judgment is not the biological professional judgment, but that it comes together in her larger understanding of reality. Uh, is that religious? Well, it's not religious in the sense of having a sense of uh, a God up there. It clearly gives up on that part of it. But it does have a life of awe, of wonder about reality, uh, of a certain sense of gratitude about for things. And to some extent, you might say it resonates, it appeals to similar human uh, sentiments, human uh, elements, that it might consider itself religious, certainly in contrast with some other naturalists who just say, well, uh, it's material and all the other language, in a sense, can be abandoned. This, these are people who like to continue a language and offer a picture of, understand, of reality that that does bring in themes that are traditionally uh, religious. Uh, well, if you have two positions, there automatically is a third, uh, namely to say we don't know for sure. Uh, in a sense, if, if both are genuine possibilities, then I think there's a, a room for saying, well, maybe we cannot, as humans, really have this kind of perspective as if we stand outside of reality and can see whether reality is there uh, or whether it's, it's made by a higher power. Uh, well, I call this a uh, serious agnostic in sense. Uh, you can also be agnostic just by not looking, by not investing energy, not spending time on, on philosophical questions. But I think even after you do the philosophical homework, you still may be agnostic in the sense of saying, well, there are more than, there are multiple options and we can't come to conclusions. The historic title that came to mind was by Nicolas of Cusa, 14th, 15th? 15th century, I think. De docta ignorantia, about learned ignorance. Well, that's a kind of word combination. It's not ignorance about laziness, it's learned ignorance. It's paying attention, trying to know what can be known, but still respecting also the limitations of knowledge. Uh, I think there's a religious dimension to this. There's a whole history of what's called negative theology. Not negative in the sense of unfriendly, but negative of respecting apophatic, of respecting that we don't know things and er everything we claim to know might be actually a hubris, might be uh, claiming too much. And that we better say, well, we don't, we know that. And many of the words, if God is called, uh, uh, um, infinite, it says God is not finite. It's, it's in a sense denying uh, what we do know, finitude, but whether we know what infinite means is not yet claimed. Yeah, it's, it's kind of open. So I think this, this agnostic attitude has its, has its religious roots as well as, as uh, I think it, it has its risks as well. If someone uh, well, some people claim, well, we don't know, and still, well, in their inside pockets, they, they, they do have all the answers, and they, there might be all the arrogance. It's like playing with the word mystery as if it's a secret that's revealed to some. Uh, well, then those are in, in a position of power relative to the others who don't have this inside knowledge. So I think if you go this agnostic line, uh, you have to respect really consistently and, and avoid that it becomes kind of abused there. Uh, a famous a quote that I like very much because it expresses this is from an American physicist, Charles Misner, to say that God created the universe does not explain either God or the universe, but it keeps our consciousness alive to mysteries of awesome majesty that we might otherwise ignore. So uh, God created the universe. It's not an explanation of God. It's not an explanation of the universe. It's more uh, a way of saying, well, there is a, a mystery that surpasses it, uh, and it keeps us, in that sense, it provides the religious language. It's a language that uh, keeps this, this idea alive without really closing the door, without saying, well, we have solved it in a specific sense. So I think this notion of mystery and understanding is one area of reflection in, well, theology and science, where there are multiple options, 
and then it becomes very philosophical about think about the nature of time and and transcendent uh, reality and so on. Uh, and, and some of the friends here in Poland like uh, are very very good in those discussions. I think I had the pleasure of being here last May for a conference on the causal universe. I think that kind of discussion: how much do we talk in causal terms? How when do we give up those causal terms? There are interesting issues there. Um, the Second and shorter uh, theme is the issue of values. I think with the dominance of the scientific understanding seems that notion of value, something that uh, surpasses reality, notion of transcendence seems to disappear. And at least that's an issue of reflection, I think, to pay attention to. And one analogy that I find attractive is mathematics, of thinking about mathematics. It starts Mathematics very human, I think, with counting and measuring, very practical. But then in a process of abstraction have come up uh, more, well, notions that are l not real. I mean, you don't count oranges, but you start working with numbers. And numbers are not, they can be used for oranges, but they, they are not. And then you get, the, in a sense, the lure of a platonic understanding of saying, well, mathematics is about those abstract entities and uh, a mathematician discovers a relation that applies there. I think that's kind of, well, an uh, option for the mathematician to, to be that way, to, to think in those terms. Uh, among current uh, major figures, I think Roger Penrose is, is leaning to the Platonist side very clearly uh, and talks about intuition that we have as a kind of access to a platonic reality. Uh, maybe the more sober option is say, no, we have really invented it. The natural numbers come most easily with counting, and then we have started to, to play with it and create ideas. But if it's a human construction, uh, it's remarkable how uh, culture independent it has become. I mean, it, at any bit of mathematics you can date historically who invented it, but it's no longer tied to it. It's, and if we were to meet extraterrestrials, they would have a different notation. But if you want to establish contact, uh, probably start with mathematics, because that would be the area where you most likely uh, understand each other, because you have the same, it seems to be there's something universal about mathematics. And the Platonist has an easy answer, because it's out there. Uh, if you are more constructivist about mathematics, you still have this uh, perspective of reaching beyond any practical way of how we, we count, how we measure, to those abstract possibilities. It's a process of abstraction that seems, at least in the, in the process, to suggest a possibility of transcendence, not as something that can be reached, that is out there, but as something that well, it's also more than, than just human-made. Uh, it's, it's clearly an option in the structure of the way things are. At least that's how I am think about mathematics, but I haven't thought enough about it. it there's certainly more uh, philosophical work for others and maybe for me. And I think morality has a slightly similar kind of structure in that we try to reach for something that's universal, for instance, in, in claiming that you shouldn't kill others, uh, or other moral commandments that transcend particular situations and particular interests. Uh, that, of course, uh, human behavior is often tied to particular interests, but that in criticizing it, there is a push for more universal principles that are transcending each particular situation. Uh, so. The scientific perspective starts, I think, with understanding why people cooperate, uh, and that serves themselves and their kin, their descendants. Uh, but in the process, somehow, this universal dimension comes up less, less so than in mathematics. It's less culture independent. There is uh, clearly more uh, human, but in reaching for public justification, where there's a group of people, and you can't just say, well, I like that, and I, I think this serves my interest. But you have to appeal to arguments that are generally acceptable. And so you reach beyond what's particular. 
So I do think in morality there's a similar possibility of thinking about, well, a, a transcendent possibility that transcends human practices in, and human interests. And I think there's a religious way of articulating that as well. There's a book that's 20 years old already by Stuart Sutherland, uh, what is titled The Legacy of Theism. Uh, but he speaks of the religious perspective as a few subspatiate tenitatis, as if from the point of eternity. He doesn't claim that we can ever reach that, but that in transcending a particular perspective, you try, or at least in, in, well, in keeping that ambition alive, you, you have a certain stance in, in the actual situation where you are. He refers to a novel where someone is contemplating what to do and gets the advice to become a school teacher. And that's not the kind of great career that the person would think of, but no, be a teacher. If you do well, um, you will know it, your students will know it, and God will know it. Well, what is this? That's what he's writing about. God will know it. Is that, that there is a kind of big brother who's collecting knowledge? No, that's not what makes the meaningfulness of becoming a school teacher. The God will know it is, uh, it has a kind of intrinsic value that holds up in the light of eternity. It, it is reaching beyond the particulars of the situation. And that's kind of uh, seeking, uh, a, well, to acknowledge that there are, are human interests, but in, well, maybe it's a bit like Mister's quote at the end of the previous section, uh, in allowing the option that there, well, there not is, but it's kind of a limit notion. Like in mathematics, you can have a series and you can, as if it's completed, think what would it end up as, even though it's not completed. And it will never be completed by humans because the series is way too long. But still, allowing for this idea of completion uh, allows for a certain way of looking back upon the series. Well, anyhow, I think the issue of how do we understand values, there's much more, of course, that could be discussed uh, third and last uh, in a material world. Uh, what do we think about personal meaning? Meaning I associate more with uh, identity issues. Who are you? Why do you make the choice you do? Uh, with the values, it's more abstracting from personal identity. It's more talking in universal terms, but there is also this personal sense. You need a map, you also need a point, well, this is where you are on the map. Otherwise, the map becomes, uh, it's useless. Uh, so this kind of personal side, I do think that the myth, creation stories, other stories are part of what helps us find a place on the map of choosing a place on the map in a sense of uh, defining where we are in relation to what else. Uh, I do think those kind of stories are important for humans. There are important ways of in, in education, in, in shaping a culture, in continuing to living together. Uh, but those myths and those creation stories are not necessarily kind of like scientific theories. I think that's the mistake of, of the creationists, that they say, well, we have a certain narrative of six days, and we somehow want to make that as if it's science. I do think it's more like, like poetry, but it's poetry uh, that's not irrelevant. It shapes a certain culture. The seven-day account certainly shaped old Israel's structure of the week and, and the Sabbath versus working days. And it has all kinds of social elements to it. Uh, as stories locate ourselves as actors in the larger narrative, uh, think of this definition by Clifford Geert. They do need to be, well, have an aura of facticity, a kind of sense that they, well, need not be real, like six days, but still that they do express, they catch something about reality. If it's only a story, then probably people will not really invest in it. Um, I think the, the appeal of the story is, uh, is in being different from reality, but also being uh, somewhat like reality. For the younger generation, the Harry Potter type of books and movies, uh, they are different, they're about this magical world. But if you read it more closely, you realize that it's also about young people, uh, well, 
finding their identity, struggling with uh, their own behavior, good and evil options, and, and relations between boys and girls, and the tensions that that gives. I mean, it's not a totally uh, unimaginable, but it's something that we can relate to, and therefore uh, it speaks to us. But of course, that still is appreciated purely as fiction, as, oh, we know who wrote it, and so on. And the, the stronger narratives are those that have somehow become more uh, part of the, of the cultural basis. So I do think that there is a role of reflecting about how humans use stories about uh, metaphors and uh, symbols and practices and rituals uh, as shaping human lives and, and the role of science. So religion and science, uh, concluding uh, sheet, religion and science is uh, mostly about an intellectual effort about arguments and they can be about many different topics, about human nature, about cosmology. Uh, but it's important to consider ideas critically. I think that's, and that's why we need the best possible science and, and try to understand what it applies. I think that's an intellectual and a moral issue. And I think there is this, uh, well, humanistic interest of having stories, having visions that combine facts and values and that help us, well, in, in the way we live, live our lives, uh, help us shape our experience, nourish our morality. Uh, well, I think that's kind of overview of how I see the field.